Hi guys, it's me Chatter HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we are going to be reviewing the first test and how the teams got on in that first test and also looking at some key stats such as lap times, uh, the amount of laps that people did, very important stats like that and also later on we will get into some technical analysis and hopefully you guys who are watching are all doing well by the time you're watching this. Uh, because we are pre-recording this, I'm probably going to be traveling to Spain at the same time that you're watching this. So, yep, hopefully you guys do enjoy today's podcast. But as ever, I need to be joined by my usual podcast guest as always, who, uh, which is Niblo. And Nib, uh, how are you doing, mate? And, well, the first test did provide, I think, plenty of interesting storylines um, i hope everyone is doing well um but yes yeah, certainly a very, very to have formula one back yeah absolutely it's great to have formula one back and hopefully um hopefully the second test just provides even more storylines when it comes to um just what is going on in formula one right now but let's get into the review of the teams and let's start off with mercedes now mercedes for most of the first test were sandbagging and weren't going for lap times and they didn't really need to the first test is more about reliability than pushing the car to see how quick it actually is um but when watching this mercedes car it has become quite clear that this car just with the grip of the car, it just doesn't look as comfortable or as good as, say, the Ferrari or the Red Bull. And to me, there is work to be done when it comes to this car. I don't think we need to start, you know, pressing the panic buttons. I don't think they are in a, or at a point where they need to start panicking. If they are half a second behind Ferrari, that can be clawed back between now and Melbourne. But definitely, um, they do need to work on some things coming away from the first test. And I don't think they had as good of a first test as really they should have, considering how they've done in the first preseason test in years gone by. Uh, but Nib, for Mercedes, what did you think of their performance? Were you uh, not too bothered by what they did? Or did you think that there is a cause for concern for mercedes a little bit of cause because being you know they know how far they are behind ferrari because the teams know a lot better than us where they are that's why toto wolf come out and said they're half a second behind ferrari and i do believe him on that it wouldn't because they can with the gps data they can roughly guess how much fuel ferrari compare to what they're doing and see that they are about half a second behind Ferrari. It, it is a little bit concerning for Mercedes. It's not the end of the world. It's not panic stations. It's, it's not like they're two off of Ferrari like they were on the first three days. That's, that's just because they're a different program. Mercedes were focusing on the race a lot more and not doing any shorter um, performance stints. Uh, obviously, on day four, they needed to do that, and, and they did so. And we'll see Mercedes show their hand a lot more come the second test. But it, Mercedes, you know, they, they've got a good amount of laps in. The drivers are saying that the car is very different, um, which always seems to be an issue with Mercedes. They always seem to struggle with, um, with the new car at the start of the season and not understanding it quite as well as, say, Ferrari. So... It's it's expected this sort of start, um, maybe not half a second behind Ferrari, but they've got good reliability and they can just look forward from now on. Yeah, I don't think, as I said a minute ago, and as you just said, I don't think they need to start panicking. Um, I think they, I think they're definitely behind Ferrari, as we'll get into uh, later on, but. There is no cause for massive concern. There is cause for concern, but not massive concern. Even if they have a slower car compared to Ferrari, by the time we get to Melbourne and even Bahrain and Shanghai, 
Um, as we saw last year, they don't have to have the fastest car to go and get the results that they need to get. So as long as, say, from now on, they close the gap to Ferrari, which I think they will, um, then you know, it's no, you know, no cause for concern, honestly. And I think in the second test, we're going to see a lot more when it comes to this team. But now moving on to Ferrari, who did have the best um, first test out of any of the teams. In my opinion, right now, they have the best car. It looks so comfortable to drive. Even the drivers, Sebastian Vettel and Charles Leclerc came out and said that this car was so comfortable to drive and was very, very good. And I'm sure on the power unit side, it's also looking good. It's looking reliable. And for Ferrari right now, it just looks very, very good. Now, in the final couple of days of testing, they didn't top the time treats like they did in the first two days. But um, I think they were running a bit more conservative on those final two days. But definitely, Nib, the best team in the first test has to be Ferrari. Uh, without a doubt, Ferrari have been so, so, so impressive right out of the block. Their car just looked quick stable and on rails the they released that on board footage of the lap that um leclerc did and the car looked on absolute rails it looked like an absolute beauty to drive so the ferrari certainly has a very good car it's obviously difficult for the outside for us to to see how far they are ahead of everyone else um and i wouldn't be surprised if um if Mercedes aren't even second in the pecking order, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Red Bull are second in the pecking order at the moment because it really does look like Mercedes are struggling. But Ferrari, what a car they have produced. You know, there was a little bit of questions going into the first test, maybe on my behalf. You know, the Ferrari didn't look as cluttered with aero bits, say, as the Red Bull or the, or the um, Mercedes. And they will and truly answer those questions within about an hour um, of track time in the first on the first day. Absolutely stunning performance all week by Ferrari. And as um, Will Buxton and the other commentator on the on the on the um, broadcasts have been saying, there's a different vibe around Ferrari, and and it's clear to see with the way they're dealing with me. And that is all down to Matteo Bonotto. Now you was I know what you're like. Oh, keep a review, Benet, but I think it is absolutely clear to see how much um, Bonotto has changed his team. And he's only been there, what, a couple of months now as the team principal? I, I think he's done a stunning job. And I think it's fair to say I was uh, spot on with this one. <laughs> I think when it comes to that, we need to wait until we get to the proper season. Because, um, yeah, these changes... I like Ferrari being a bit more media you know friendly and stuff like that but if they don't get the results that's all that matters at the end of the day i couldn't really care less if uh the team principal ferrari was nice to the media or hated the media as long as you get the results it doesn't really matter but there is no doubt ferrari have produced a very good car and they do have right now the best car on the grid that could change during the second test or the first race. But right now, I think they do have the best car. Next up is Red Bull, who during the first test, they didn't really try to test the pace of the car, but they didn't have to because this first test was always about reliability and working out how the new Honda power unit performs inside the Red Bull chassis. And the answer to that so far is it performs very, very well because they didn't have any reliability issues and the car looked good. I would say compared to the Mercedes, it did look better around the corners. Whether that means they're actually faster, we don't know yet. Um, but Red Bull do look good. I do want to see them in the second test push a bit, uh, push a bit harder Sorry, uh, with their car. But again, the first test was always going to be about reliability. And Nib, they have plenty of that. Well, it's been an absolutely brilliant start um, by Red Bull. I don't think anyone expected the the degree of reliability that they'd get out of this uh, 
Honda power units. That's that's for sure. You know, we thought they'd have a couple of breakdowns, but not a single one after four days of testing and the amount of mileage they put on that engine. Absolutely superb job by by uh, Honda. And it's certainly going to be very beneficial for Red Bull because they were always put behind everyone else after after the first um, couple of well, the first two tests, just because they didn't they didn't have as much data. They they weren't running on the track as much. They didn't potentially smooth out as many issues. And this is certainly their best start to a preseason testing since 2013. It's quite quite clearly. Because they've had absolutely no issues whatsoever, except for uh, when Gasly was pushing a little bit too much and went into the wall uh, at turn 12, I think it was. Yes, turn 12. And, you know, the Red Bull looks very good. It looks very good in the corners. And it looks like um, they are probably just ahead of Mercedes. It's very close between them and Mercedes at the moment. Of course, we don't know for sure. Just we just rough idea from what we've seen race pace, their little performance runs, which, um, which of course, Red Bull haven't done. But the Red Bull certainly does look better uh, than the Mercedes on track. And I, and I do think that Red Bull and Mercedes are very close at the moment. Yeah, they definitely are. And I hope this, um, this good story with Red Bull and Honda continues in the second test because the last thing I, I would want to see... Is it for it? Is it for it to come crashing down in terms of reliability and also pace? If the pace of the car isn't as good as maybe we think it is, so hopefully the second test for Red Bull goes well. But yeah, first test very very good. I thought they were going to break down at least twice um, on the first day. Never mind the uh, during the first test. But yeah, no breakdowns. Hundred percent reliability. That is fantastic. But now let's go on to the midfield. And first off, let's go to Renault, who started off slowly. Um, I think they were trying to test out reliability, which, of course, for Renault is very, very important. And, well, in the first couple of days of testing, in terms of power unit reliability, they did have it. But then they did have, uh, with Daniel Ricciardo, that rear wing failure, which was quite scary with him uh, but then they did in the final two days of the first test push a bit harder but then um, at the end of day four Hulkenberg had a breakdown and that was not a good way for Renault to end the first pre-season test but I think Renault got better as um, as the first test went on but I will say I'm not as impressed by them as I am other teams. And I thought they would be maybe a bit better so far. But then again, maybe they are holding something back and they are very, very quick. We don't know. But I haven't... I don't know what you think, Nib, but so far in terms of how the car looks on track, I just haven't been massively impressed. What do you think? Well, on day three and day four, the car certainly looked a lot better on track. They were able to uh, pick up the pace from day one and day two very quickly. Of course, they were just doing long runs, which I must mention this. They were very, very close to Mercedes on long run pace. The the mid the midfield are very close to the top three, and it's it's clear to see. It's it's really really awesome to see. So I Renault are certainly a lot better than what I've been hearing you say. I think you've been underestimating how, how quite quick Renault are at the moment. They just weren't showing it in the first couple of days. Of course, they had they couldn't open up the DRS um, flap. And when they did, it, it snapped in half. So, um, But they have addressed that issue now. Um, they were running with the DRS open all of um, the day four of the test. And every, there was no dramas whatsoever. So... Renault, Renault are definitely in a good position, um, as we'll get on to in a minute. The, the, them and Alpha are pretty close, but at the moment, Renault would just edge it for me. And, you know, the, things do look promising for Renault. They're in a very good position to start off the season, because even this time last year, they weren't in this good of a position starting off the season. So all positive signs are at Renault. 
Um, yeah, maybe I am underestimating Renault, but just compared to the other teams so far, I don't know why I just haven't been as impressed by their car. It's not a bad looking car or anything. It does look good. And definitely day three and day four, you've got to uh, see more of how good the Renault car could be. But um, as I'll get onto later on, I don't think they're as good as maybe you are thinking or some others are thinking but of course I could be wrong but we'll get onto that later on but now before we get on to Alfa Romeo and the rest of the teams let's first go to McLaren who they don't I don't think they actually have that quick of a car but if you compare this McLaren to the 2018 McLaren in the first four days of the first test last season the McLaren for me is looking better and most importantly it is looking a lot more reliable and that is very very important because in pre-season testing in 2018 even 2017 it was blighted by unreliability and for the first time in a long time McLaren so far have had um, a reliable pre-season testing and that is so important because if your car is reliable you can then start, you know, trying to develop parts for your car and trying to see how quick it is instead of focusing on reliability, which is not going to make your car any faster. It will keep you on track, of course, but it's not going to make your car any faster. So it is very good to see that they are reliable, which is something they haven't been for quite a few years. But Nib, um, after the first four days of testing, what did you make of McLaren? Um, I must say they have one of the most underrated liveries on the grid. I think it absolutely absolutely looks beautiful. But on to the more serious stuff now. They they look better than certainly what they did at the end of last season. You know, they're not gonna be at the back with with Williams or anything. They they look like they're gonna be more into the midfield, but yeah, yeah I don't think they really do have a quick car. Um there's certainly a lot of room for improvement with, with McLaren. Um, you know, Lando Norris said they, they sort of know the issues that need to need to be addressed. Um, so hopefully they are addressed. But yeah, a little bit concerning for McLaren. And I heard Will Buxton saying, um, I can't remember what day it was of the test, but according to insiders and a few rumours, McLaren are about two seconds off where they actually wanted to be. So um, that that's that's a bit interesting because if they were if they were two seconds off where they wanted to be, uh, they'd be right there with Ferrari and and Mercedes and Red Bull. So a bit that's a bit of an interesting comment. I I do think that this car hasn't quite met their expectations because of course it is the all high and mighty McLaren. Um, I'm saying that very very ironically. Um, <laughs> Um. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. This for McLaren. I think the second test will will learn a lot more about McLaren. They've had very good reliability, bullet proof reliability, which is very good. Um. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely see a lot more in the second. Yeah, we definitely will. Um, and hopefully they can show some more pace because again. I don't think they're actually that quick. I think they are quicker in the pecking order compared to where they were at the end of 2018. But as I'll get on to later on, that probably isn't going to be quick enough to be considered a good season for McLaren. But I'll get on to that later on. Next up, though, is Alfa Romeo, who had a fantastic first pre-season test and I know they're not Sauber anymore but if you effectively count it as Sauber this is the best pre-season testing this team where they are based have had for a long long time the car is very quick it looks very stable and already it seems as though Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi are really taking to this car and it looks great on track and I think this car is going to be super competitive for the second test but also 2019 it just looks like one of those cars that 
you know, straight out of the blocks looks good. And it's going to be one of those cars which is just consistently good as the season goes on. And I don't know what you think, Nib, but for me, this team, and I think you actually said this a few weeks ago, but I, I agree with it now. I think Alfa Romeo are the dark horse of 2019. After what we've seen for the first four days of testing, do you still uh, maintain that opinion? I still very much maintain that opinion. I remember I said it when um they released those um pictures when they were when they were doing their shakedown. I'm like, wow, this car looks very very good with the amount of aero detail that they have on the car, and I've I've been kind of proven right so far. They they are I think five seconds quicker than what they were this time last year in preseason testing. They're quicker than what they were in qualifying last year. Not the only team who are quicker in qualifying. Um, than, they're quicker now than what they were in qualifying last year at, at the Spanish Grand Prix. So Alfa Romeo definitely looked brilliant. They were, Of course, everyone's seen that on board of Kimi Raikkonen's fastest lap on the... Um, was it the C4 or the C5? I can't remember. But... It doesn't really matter what compound. The car looked on absolute rails, and he said that he really wasn't pushing the car. So once we see some more truer performance coming out of that um, Alfa Romeo, it's going to be very interesting to see where they are. I do think they are just just behind Renault. Um, but then once again, Renault, I don't think are too far behind Mercedes and Red Bull. So... I, I wouldn't be surprised if Alpha are in are going to be the fourth best team or the third best team at stages in this season with some money. The rest of the car looks superb. And, you know, Giovinazzi didn't have got lots and lots of miles under his belt, which is good, but I don't think he'll be as quick as Kimi. But having Kimi in that team, they'll be able to develop the car um, in a lot better way say they got that experienced guy in the team he knows what need will need to be developed because of course he was driving the ferrari last year he knows where the car needs to improve better than say giovinazzi who's only done two races in formula one and i and i do, don't see them really stopping some very good development throughout the season their front wing is absolutely bonkers and and it sort of looks like the one of the better sit, um solutions to the to the front new front wing um, regulations say different very different to the uh, to the Mercedes and the Red Bull but quite similar to um, the Ferrari style front wing and it's certainly looking very very good for Alfa Romeo they have some very very good pace it's clear to see it, now they just need to sort see where they are in the long runs that they they're roundabouts where Renault are but just a little bit behind Renault on the on the long runs so. A very um, it's got well once again second test is going to be a uh, very interesting. Yes, it definitely is for Alfa Romeo, and hopefully they can keep this up because they are looking good, but also looking good is Haas. Now, um, one thing I want to say actually before we talk about the car is I am actually liking the livery better in the proper sunlight i still don't think it is that great but it looks better to me in natural sunlight but we'll get on to the car now for me this car is looking good and i i think is right there at the front of the midfield i really do the drivers sound very happy in this car roman grosjean has come out and said that the car really does feel good but the big worry for haas is reliability and they had plenty of reliability issues during the first test two breakdowns i believe with roman grosjean that is not good they were basically the most unreliable team um during the first test and of course you don't want to have that tag next to uh next to next to sorry your name um but yeah the Haas car once it's running and they're really pushing it it does look like a good car and i i wouldn't be surprised nib if this car is you know more towards the front of the midfield again i don't know what you think but for me this Haas car is is looking good 
Indeed, Haas are looking very good after the first pre-season test in Barcelona. They cert- they look very close behind and even with Alfa Romeo and Renault, which I don't think many of us did expect after um, after what a great season they had last year. I think we expected them to drop off the pace a fair bit and maybe drop down the midfield. And I, I don't think you can really say that. The car looks really good whenever it's on track. The car looks really stable. Of course, as you mentioned, they had a couple of reliability issues. Um, that was just some... I think they had three um, electrical faults, which were the exact same issue. Um, so it's it's not, not much of a major issue. This is what pre-season testing is, is for. It's to get rid of those sort of issues that might bug you throughout the season now. So it's much better for it to be happening in pre-season testing than it is at the first race or any time throughout the season. So I do think it's been a very positive test for Haas and a bit of a surprise for me. They've been they've been very good and going underneath the radar because of how well Alpha Alpha Romeo are doing and because of the sort of headline laps that say Toro Rosso and other teams are putting in. So very, very much looking forward to see this uh, Haas on track come the, the first Grand Prix. Yeah, I think this is um, a good car. And as long as they get those reliability issues sorted out, and as you said, pre-season testing is about getting these issues sorted out. And also, it's better these things happen during testing instead of um, in a Grand Prix when you're heading for a great result. So I think things for Haas... Um, compared to where I thought they would be, they're looking better than I expected. And hopefully that does continue. But now let's get into Racing Point. And well, there's nothing much to talk about because Racing Point in the first test weren't really trying to do any lap times or really test out how quick their car was. This car is basically a 2018 car. And then, you know, the important areas have met the 2019 regulations. But yeah, this car is not very developed. And they didn't really do that many laps. They just didn't really have that interesting of a a first test. And hopefully for the second test, they are a bit more interesting. But yeah, nothing uh, much to really talk about, is there, Nib, with with, uh, Racing Point? Uh, No, not at all. Um... It is a 2018 car at the moment. You know, just as you as you mentioned, it's modified to meet these regulations. They had they had new bits and pieces arrive during the week. They had a new floor, the 2019 floor arrive, which is good to see. But all of their major upgrades are going to come in Melbourne. They're going to have a completely different car in Melbourne. So I don't think we can really read into much of what Racing Point. So, Sport Pesta Racing Point are doing <laughs> at the moment. So, I I don't I think these tests are just a little bit uh, useless to them really, because the car's going to be com- completely different in Melbourne. We're going to see in the first practice session in Melbourne they're going to be running a lot of um of aero instruments on the car to to see how these new parts are performing on track. So. I think they will probably have another slower start to the season, but it's just because, you know, of how much they were struggling with cash last year um, that they're not able to get the parts really there on time. Of course, um, Williams couldn't do this because they had just a completely whole new car. So Force India have kind of avoided that situation happening, which, which is which is very good. But, sorry... Racing point. Um, <laughs> for Christ's sake, it, it's just going to happen every single time because you're used to saying Force India and then you realize, oh no, they're called Racing Point. So, Racing Point, they are. I, I want them to do more laps though because, you know, you could have a couple of issues, say, like Haas are having with, you know, an electrical fault or something like that. So, I would like to see some more lap done by, by Racing Point in the second test. Yeah, I think they need to go for some more because, as you said, um, they haven't really hit that point where they're trying to or they're finding issues because 
uh, they're not running long enough and if they don't find these uh, reliability issues which could happen and then they happen during the season it could be a disaster they've got to do more laps and they need to try and understand their new car more but moving on to toro rosso who in the first couple of days of testing i wasn't that impressed with uh, but in the final couple of days i was more impressed with i think they are compared to 2018 honestly i think they're right about where they were last season in terms of the pecking order um but i think they are a bit closer say to the top of the midfield and again in the final couple days of the first test they looked a lot better with their car than they did in the first couple days and also with the honda power unit they were really looking good uh nib for toro rosso were you impressed by them or do you not or are you not really that impressed with what they did in the first four days of testing it's tough to say with toro rosso um they they look better than what they did this time last year of course they are quicker at the moment than what they were in qualifying this time at barcelona last year so that is promising they're not the only team of course like salva are as as well but yeah toro rosso on on track it looks like their car isn't the greatest but they're still putting in some very good lap times um of course, Alban and Kvyat have put in some some really good lap times, and that both drivers have said, you know, we're not really pushing to the limit yet. So it's it's quite scary to see that these cars are going to be mega quick and really on par with last year's car from the first race or even right now. So it, Toro Rosso, that that I think they need to improve just slightly their car. I think they are very close to that, um, to the top of the midfield, but they are. I do see them just being a little bit behind, behind that group of say Alfa Romeo, Renault, and and Haas. So, you know, it's been such a positive first week, of course, once again for Toro Rosso. The amount of laps that they have done with the Honda Power Unit, I think Albon did 150 odd laps the other day, which is. Um, which is very impressive. I don't think I'd ever be speaking about a Honda engine in that in that sort of way and, and praising it so much for its reliability, even compared to last year. That Honda have made so many so much progress on on their reliability side. So it's really really good to see um, with that. But there was um, someone from Toro Rosso speaking on the broadcasts with Will Buxton and the other guy. And he was explaining perhaps why Ferrari have got so much pace here. And that's because because of the colder conditions, you need to run more wing than, than other teams for, to get more performance. And he believes that, um, that Ferrari are run, running a lot more wing than anyone else. So, you know, this could be a little bit misleading, all these preseason results, um, which, which it is very hard to get a true pecking order. So I I just thought I'd like to uh point that out that perhaps it's because Ferrari and other, some other teams are running quite a amount of high wing and of course when you come to Australia in three weeks it's not going to be two degrees or or you know ten degrees cold it's going to be you know twenty five at the bare minimum so it, that'll that'll be an interesting story once we get to Melbourne to see if that is um sort of true. Yeah, that will be interesting um, to see if maybe Ferrari's pace has been made to look better because of that. I hope not. I hope they're not uh, massively slower than we think. Uh, but of course, we will see. But there is, of course, one final team we must go on to. And that is the Toothpaste Williams, who have had the worst preseason testing that they've ever had. They didn't turn up to the first two and a half days of testing. They only did one and a half days out of the four. And the reason it's so bad is because um, they were so bad in 2018. You would have thought they'd be working like crazy to get 2019 right. And 
I think they were in the final few races of 2018, but they've turned up to 2019 and then they're still not ready compared to other teams um, who you would expect to be less ready than them. It's so, so embarrassing. And again, I have to say, hashtag Claire out. She has to go. This is her responsibility when it comes to not being ready for the first test. Also, Paddy Lowe has to take responsibility, but mainly Claire Williams is responsible for the disaster that has happened. And even when Williams got out on the track, the car doesn't look that good. And I think it is a very, very slow car. And Nib, I don't know what you think, but for me, I don't see how Williams can possibly, I hope they can, but I don't see how they can possibly have a successful season. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. The Williams is very, very underdeveloped compared to any car on the grid, and that's even compared to a 2018 Force India. Um, <laughs> the, the car, yeah, the car just doesn't look good at all. You know, we we effectively seen their shakedown um, live on on the on the um, on the broadcast, the F1 and Sky Sports broadcast. You know, it's there's nothing. There's just nothing special about the car. Um, there's no, there's no like aero bits. You're like, oh, that's cool. There, there's absolutely none of that. The car looks almost a bit, a bit similar to last year with the amount of detail that's in the bardboard area, which is basically none. Um, that, that doesn't, it doesn't look like they've made any improvement really at all. Hopefully, they've got some bits and pieces that they can bolt onto the car um say before melbourne or even in the second test um to try and lift the performance of the car but i don't think there will be if they struggle to get the the normal car out here out sorry out to barcelona i i don't see them bringing any any slight upgrades before melbourne who knows we could see them but i don't i doubt that they will really do anything and it certainly looks like uh Williams a, a big way away from from the midfield. Yeah, I I think they are. I think they are similar to Manor in 2015. They're just cut adrift from the rest of the field. It, it is sad, but they put themselves in this position. Yes, they don't have the cash, but look at um well now Racing Point, but previously Force India. Even if you don't have that much money, you can still do very well. And they put themselves, Williams, in this position. And I don't think they deserve really any sympathy. Because again, they have caused their own downfall. But let's move on from the teams um, and how they did in the first test. And let's go on to a few interesting graphics that I have designed to really illustrate maybe... Who does have the pace and who does not? So I've got here a, um, a results graphic and this is the fastest driver for each team during the four days of testing. So for example, this is only going to be the fastest driver from each team. This is not going to be just the fastest times no matter if it's you know, two drivers from the same team. So for example, Nico Hulkenberg did the fastest time in the first test, a 17.3 on the C5, and then Albin did a 17.6 on the C5, Raikkonen a 17.7 on the C5, and then Bottas a 17.8 on the C5. Leclerc did a very impressive 18 flat on the C3. Norris did an 18.4 on the C4, and then Grosjean did a very impressive 18.5 on the C3. Uh, Gasly an 18.7 on the C3, Lance Stroll a 19.6 on the C2, not too bad considering it's a 2018 car mostly. But then George Russell a 1 minute 20.9 on the C3. So yeah, that would pretty much confirm that they are about at best 2 seconds away from the rest of the field but let me now get into showing how many laps were completed for some of the teams and also for the uh, manufacturers and their power units so these are the laps completed 
for the team. So Mercedes did the most amount of laps during the first test, 610. Then it's Ferrari on 598. Then Alfa Romeo on 507. And then Toro Rosso just ahead of Red Bull on 482. Red Bull did 475. So very impressive there for Honda. McLaren, 445. Renault, 433. And then Haas, 384. Racing Point, not that many compared to the others on 248. And then Williams, 88. Very embarrassing. But then if I move on to the power units, Ferrari, the Ferrari power unit, which is in the, of course, the works team, but also the Alfa Romeo and the Haas has done 1,489 laps. The Honda power unit teams have done 957, just beating the Mercedes power unit teams of 946. But I will stress, um, the reason Mercedes are not second in that is because Racing Point and Williams have not done really many laps. And of course, Williams missed two and a half days of testing. So I think Mercedes are basically better than Honda when it comes to that. Because, again, Williams not running and Racing Point not running as much as they could has affected that. And then the Renault Power Unit has completed um, 878 laps. Now, before we get into some technical analysis of the 2019 cars and the upgrades they have brought for testing i just want to get into my pecking order after the first test and i'll also ask nib what his pecking order is so far um but this is my pecking order after the first four days of testing i'm probably wrong with three teams i'd say uh, but i think the rough idea is about right uh so far so right now in my opinion, Ferrari have the best car. Then it's Mercedes just ahead of Red Bull. Now, the reason I've gone for Mercedes ahead of Red Bull is because Red Bull haven't really pushed their car. Um, once they do, then we'll get a better idea of how good their car is. Then in fourth, I've gone for Alfa Romeo. But then fifth, I have gone for Haas just ahead of Renault. But I will stress... That Alfa Romeo, Haas and Renault for me in 4th, 5th and 6th are very, very close. But I think right now Alfa Romeo and Haas do have a better car. And then in P7, I think is Toro Rosso. Ahead of McLaren. And then Racing Point is 9th. And then Williams are 10th. Now, with that pecking order, uh, Nib, do you disagree? I'm going to assume you disagree with the 4th, 5th, and 6th, and probably 2nd and 3rd. Uh, yes, I do. But first of all, I just want to say this is uh, some F1 journalists' uh, pecking order, which is which is quite funny. So, 1, it's 2, impossible, 3, 2, 4, say... Um, 5, this, 6, early, 7, in, 8, preseason testing... 10 Williams. So, uh, of course, <laughs> Williams are at the bottom. So, I just thought I'd, I'd read it out just to uh, mean Williams, which I, I think they thoroughly deserve at the moment. Uh, but my pecking order at the moment, uh, quite clearly, Ferrari are, are at the top um, of, of the order at the moment. Uh, second, I've gone with Red Bull because their long round data and, and times have been better than Mercedes. Um, Mercedes really do look to be struggling, especially in, in the slower corners. Um, then in fourth, I have Renault, uh, just just in front of Alfa Romeo and Haas. Uh, in seventh, I have Toro Rosso. In eighth, I have McLaren. Then ninth, I have Racing Point. And then in tenth, I have Williams. Of course, I do think that this will change come the first race. I do think Racing Point will probably jump up a couple of spots and be a lot closer to, say, Haas, um, Alpha and Renault with their completely new um, car that they're going to have in time for Australia. So that is my current order um, for pre-season testing in terms of the pace of the cars. I, we will know a lot more come, come the next test when everyone has done some performance runs. So that will be uh, a lot handy in, in determining a, a very rough, rough order. Of course, this is not exact. This is just a rough uh, guesstimate on, on Chaz's and I behalf. 
yeah, again, we have to stress, this is basically us guessing based on the times, also long run pace and the looks of the car around the track. And to be honest, a bit of talk around the paddock has also influenced my pecking order. And I think the pecking order that uh, I've gone with and also Nib has gone with isn't that dramatic or controversial. I think it is about right. Um, not a massive difference compared to the end of last year, I'm going to be honest, because Sauber did have the best car in the midfield at the end of last year with Haas. Um, and then Renault were kind of there. So it's not that much different to um, to the end of 2018. But also, I want to say this. I think Alfa Romeo and Haas and Renault are a lot closer to Red Bull than people think. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, say, Kimi Raikkonen at the first race, or maybe even in Bahrain, Bahrain tends to be a better track for him. I wouldn't be surprised if Kimi Raikkonen, on pace, not because of penalties or luck, um, I wouldn't be surprised if he lined up on the third row of the grid. I think that Alfa Romeo is that quick. We'll have to see, though, once we get to those races. But now, we are going to get into technical analysis of all of the cars, except for the Racing Point, because the Racing Point is, again, basically just a 2018 car with certain parts meeting the 2019 regulations so we're not going to analyze that car but we will the rest of the teams and i'm going to let nib uh take it from here so we're starting off uh, starting off with mercedes and then we'll go all the way through until williams so nib take it away indeed and with racing point um once we come to australia and we actually see their car that they're going to run for 2019 I'm sure that we will do some analysis on that car, comparing it to um, the car that they currently are running at pre-season testing. But yes, on to Mercedes, and we have a uh, we have a shot of the front of their car with the front wing. Of course, they've gone in a very different direction to um, to Ferrari in this area. They've, they haven't lowered the the outer um, the outer little elements. Um, as we head towards the end plate. And of course, the end plate is um, going inwards, trying to create like a sort of nozzle effect. You can see the little flap adjuster. It looks like they're all, the, well, the end plate and the flap adjuster are pointing in towards each other, trying to create a sort of nozzle effect to try and uh, drive wing, uh, sorry, not drive wing, drive the air um, around the front tyre and in towards the barge board area. But now moving on to the barge boards, and as ever, the Fer the not the Ferrari, the Mercedes barge boards looking very nice as ever. I must say, though, there isn't quite as many cuts and little slots in the Mercedes barge boards as there were, as there were last year. So I do expect some uh, little developments being done before Melbourne and perhaps in the second preseason test um adding some little cuts and slots on on the in the barge boards area from from mercedes still very complex and very um developed compared to mostly any other team but now we'll move on to the shot of say the uh the, the side pod the just little the little um element the little um aero structure next to the side pod and as you can see there's some lovely detail of how Mercedes are trying to get the airflow down towards into the floor and as it moves back around towards the uh towards the rear wing and the diffuser you know if if they were just if those little um those little pieces um of carbon fiber were were pointing upwards then it wouldn't be very effective of effective at all in creating more downforce but having it pointed down in that angle driving it towards all the little cuts and slots in the floor and towards the diffuser and the rear wing just helps create more downforce. But now moving on to the rear wing, which you can see has a lot of um, aero paint on it. I think this might have been from the first day of pre-season testing. And we haven't really had too many fantastic shots of the Mercedes rear wing. You know, some very nice detail in the rear wing. Those lots of little um, cuts and slots in the rear wing. 
Um, a bit different to, say, the Ferrari rear wing, but it still does its job in creating as much downforce as possible. But now moving on to the fastest team so far in pre-season testing. We'll go on to that um, front shot of the Ferrari as they're trundling down the pit line at the circuit to Catalonia. As you can see, the you can see perfectly how much how how much difference there is in between the Ferrari and Mercedes front wing. You know, Ferrari running that sort of flattened out um, sort of style, curved out style as you head towards the end plate, and of course Ferrari very differently to Mercedes are running that end end plate in a usual way to to direct the airflow out around the tyre instead of trying to do that sort of nozzle effect that, say, um, Mercedes are trying to do, which is which is very interesting, very 2009-esque, that, that sort of strategy. We've seen a lot of teams attempt that in 2009, and it didn't quite work out for them. But some lovely little um, detail here on, on the um, Ferrari front wing. Very similar to the Alfa Romeo, not as aggressive and as radical as the Alfa Romeo, but certainly it's doing its job, as we can see from how quick Ferrari are in the pre-season test. But now moving on to the barge board area. As you can see, probably a, l a little bit less here on the car um, than the Mercedes, but they do have a little little cuts and slots um, just on the leading edge. Of, of the floor no yes of the floor there just to, just where the barge boards are at the front um a little few more cuts and slots in in there than mercedes but still everything is doing their job and of course those upper um elements those those upper bits of barge boards um just below the mission win now um little logo there those have that's a little loophole uh in the um in the regulations that both Red Bull and Ferrari have um, found, where just there they can have those parts of the barge boards raised up to the levels that they were at last year, and even a little bit higher um, in this case. So, little little good um, spot there by Red Bull and um, Ferrari, but the, certainly the barge boards are doing their job for what is looking the fastest car at the moment. But and now moving on to the rear wing of the Ferrari. As you can see there, the amount of little cuts and slots in the rear wing are absolutely incredible, creating just as much downforce on the rear of the car, which is so, so important Actually, at the top order of the grid. It's something that Red Bull did really struggle with uh, in 2017 was the amount of rear downforce they have. And it's clear to see that Ferrari aren't lacking any rear downforce here with their beautifully complex rear wing. It really is even more developed than, than the Mercedes. So credit has to go to Ferrari there. And it is certainly going to be a little um, big part of the development at um, throughout the season, even though, you know, it's all the regulations haven't changed too much with the front wing. It's just a little bit higher. Um, but it's certainly going to be um, very important throughout this season but now moving on to the Red Bull of course with their front wing they have a very um a very Mercedes S um front wing except their end plates do curve out like a normal front wing does of course Red Mercedes going for that different um design strategy um there of course like as I mentioned um uh, you can see there is a little um slot just above uh, just below the Aston Martin logo where the barge board is in a higher spot like Ferrari have done and of course Red Bull have got their boomerang wing which they have been running since last year now and a lot more cuts and slots on the floor and uh, and on an and in the barge board area than say Ferrari and even Mercedes and Mercedes really last year they they had so many cuts and slots in the front wing that you couldn't even count them all on the barge board area so it is interesting to see that Mercedes have gone away from that a little bit so maybe we see some more cuts and slots in the barge board area um, than on the Mercedes in the second pre-season test that will be uh, 
that'll be interesting to see if there is any more development on that on that front but the Red Bull certainly is working very well as they did bring a new rear wing um, on the third day of testing which Christian Horner says that the numbers are working very well maybe not as many um, cuts and slots um, as the um, as say the Ferrari but certainly towards the end just below just above the diffuser sorry there are lots of um, cuts and slots just to try and attach that air to the diffuser and make the diffuser work a lot better um, than what it say potentially was but the the Red Bull rear wing certainly has some some more development um, there that's that's for sure it's certainly not the finished product and I and I expect them to bring a lot of um, a, another new w rear wing um, some stage during the season but now moving on to Renault of course their front wing is sort of an in-between it's a tweener of the of say the Ferrari and the Mercedes and Red Bull style front wing it has towards the end plate those front wing um, elements are lowered down to try and create that outwash effect which I talk so much about in the car launches but it's certainly it's certainly a lot lower down and not as high up um, than say the Ferraris and the Mercedes, but moving on to the barge board area of the Renault, it's certainly looking a lot more complicated in that area than what there was last year. There's a lot more um, cuts and slots than what there were last year, but there still is room for improvement in this area. It's certainly not as detailed as the Ferrari, Red Bull, and Mercedes. So that will be a key area of development as ever and for every team on the grid in the upcoming season. But certainly some nice complexity there in the barge board area and especially with the cuts and slots. And that's That certainly reminds me of Mercedes last year, how many cuts and slots there are. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen. About sixteen um, cuts just in that leading edge of the barge board area. So, some very nice detail there by Renault. And then moving on to this very, very different rear wing that Renault have got. It's very different compared to anyone else. I haven't got an an outside shot of it, sadly, so I can't really see how many strakes and stuff they're running towards the diffuser. But they've got like twisted carbon fiber in that in that part where the um where the rear wing goes over the rear tire. So a very interesting um des rear wing design here by Renault. I can't quite explain it. I don't think my technical analysis is at this level to explain. Uh, exactly what they are trying to achieve and what it is achieving by um, having the rear wing like this, but it is um, certainly different to any other team that we have had on the grid so far. But now moving on to Haas, and the Haas certainly, I must say, delivery is looking a lot better um, than what it was um, at the initial launch, as you had said earlier, Chaz. But with the front wing, the running is sort of very similar front wing to Renault. And in between, it's not too radical to a point of, you know, an Alfa Romeo or a, or a, or, or a Ferrari. And it's not like Mercedes. It's very similar to that Renault um, front wing. And of course, they are running with the end plate, trying to get that outwash out around the outside of the front tyre. But moving on to the barge board area, when I can find the image, there it is. Lots of little, um, lots of little bits of carbon fiber there, just to try and condition the airflow through the barge board area. And for a midfield team, this is certainly some very, um, very good detail here by the American team. And you can probably see why they are doing so well. Just from this area, it's looking like an even more developed sort of Mercedes barge board area. Um, it's in, in other areas in this barge board area, it's not as complex as Mercedes, but in terms of having just little airflow conditioners um, at the front of the, of the barge board area, they have certainly done a very good job on that. And Haas will certainly be looking to bring further upgrades to this area where they can find more performance uh, 
throughout the season. But moving on to their rear wing, I've got a really lovely shot here of the Haas rear wing. Um, for whatever reason, they are on the intermediate tyres. I remember um, Kevin Magnussen went out on the intermediate tyres one day, but of course that is the 51 that Haas are mandated for, which Pietro Fittipaldi was running on day three. But once again, lovely, lovely detail here in, in the rear wing of the Haas. So many long um, cuts in the rear wing to, down towards the diffuser and some little nice slots just and cuts in the rear wing just above the rear tyre. Um, obviously, it's behind the rear tyre, but just above where the rear tyre sits on the actual car. Um, just trying to create as much downforce as possible. It certainly is looking very nice and complex, that Haas rear wing. But moving on to McLaren, their front wing does look beautiful. And once again, it is sort of that in-betweener of the Mercedes and um, and Ferrari front wing design. But I must say that the, the bottom element is raised up a lot to try and get as much airflow as possible underneath the car and then try to get to sucked in by the S-duct using those turning vanes underneath the front wing and then try to get that through the S-duct or either into the barge boards to try and create as much downforce as possible. And of course, we have a little nice shot there of where the S... No, that's not the S-duct, but that's just a nice little detail of the McLaren front wing that we have there. But moving on to the barge boards area, there is really not a lot at the front of the barge board area. There's just mainly cuts and slots in the floor, which of course is very important to try and create as much vortices and condition the airflow as possible. But at the front of that barge board area, that really isn't ma anything major. They've just tried to run with this very odd boomerang wing that they've got here. I wouldn't even call it a boomerang wing because it isn't curved. It's just a very big piece of carbon fiber that is then attached to the floor. But I must say this is a big improvement from what they had on the car last year. But there certainly is room improvement to stick more bits and pieces, say similar to Haas and the Mercedes, um, just at the front of that barge board area. But now moving on to the Husky Chocolate rear wing, of course. There's some beautiful cuts and slots once again in the rear wing. And as you can see there, that gives a better idea of how radical um, the the Renault rear wing is, say, compared to the McLaren. It's, you know, it's only got that one main um, part, which is attaching the top part from the lower part of the rear wing, whereas... Renault have got all these little curved bits which are connecting it, um, connecting the bottom of the rear wing to the top of the rear wing. So it's certainly going to be an interesting part of the car to look at throughout the season with um, some teams creating some new beautiful rear wings. But now moving on to the Toro Rosso, of course, at launch, um, Toro Rosso had a very different front wing. They had a very Mercedes and Red Bull-esque front wing. But they have already adopted the Alfa Romeo and Ferrari sort of style rear wing. Oh, sorry, front wing, where the where the outer elements towards the end plate cur curve down and flatten out to try and create that outwash effect um, on the car. And as you can see there, the front wing, the bottom the bottom element of the front wing is not as low as it possibly could be, and that's just to try and get as much airflow underneath the front wing as well to get towards the diffuser and get it towards the rear end of the car. But moving on to the barge boards area, certainly probably one of the least um, complex and underdeveloped um, barge boards area on the grid. There really isn't a lot to talk about here. There are some cuts and slots on the, on the leading edge of the floor that we can't see because the front tire is obstructing our view there. But it just reminds me of, say, a normal barge board that we used to have. It doesn't really remind me of anything that Mercedes or Ferrari have had, which has proven to be so successful over the last couple of years once they have opened up the development in the barge board area. So maybe in a room room for improvement and room for development there um, for Toro Rosso, but I think every team has room for development in that area, which you can gain so much performance from. But now we'll move on to the rear wing. 
and I wouldn't be surprised if we uh we see an, a re- a very uh, an early season rear wing update by Toro Rosso. There's a few cuts and slots um, on the rear wing, but certainly not as many as any other team. And where the rear wing curves out over the front of over the the rear tire, sorry, there isn't any cuts in that area. So definitely a little bit of an underdeveloped rear wing there by by Toro Rosso. But of course they have diff- they might have different priorities with their rear wing than any than other teams. So be interesting to see what Toro Rosso do there with their rear wing. But now moving on to, of course, the Williams. And boy, oh boy, is this car underdeveloped. The front wing design is very, very weird. Very weird. Very different from any anything else that anybody else has done. The, the elements towards the end plate are raised up. And then it looks like they've tried to, in the middle of the front wing, sort of that's where they're trying to get the air as the as the parts of the front wing towards the um the neutral zone of the front wing uh, very weird it's a very weird front wing by williams um not sure what paddy low was thinking there but of course these are the first pictures we have seen of the williams on track and as i was mentioning through um pre-season test uh sorry not pre-season testing through the the car launches Mercedes running that um that suspension element um higher than anyone else and as you can see Williams have indeed um copied Mercedes on that design and so have McLaren I believe whereas it was only Mercedes and Toro Rosso doing that last year but moving on to the barge board area of the Williams certainly a little bit um a little bit more complex than say last year but still majorly under underdeveloped compared to last year and anyone else on the grid this year it just looks like there there really isn't there isn't really an effort to to condition the airflow there and create as much vort- vortex um there isn't many vortex generators there on the floor say like the Haas um just very underdeveloped very very underdeveloped in that area and I didn't really expect anything else from Williams after they showed up late to testing and and after how underdeveloped that area of the car was on the Williams last season. But now moving on to the rear shot of the Williams. Pretty similar to the Toro Rosso. They've got some nice strikes to, down towards the bottom of the rear wing. But say where the, it, where the rear wing curves out, there is, there is no real major cuts or slots, so certainly a lot, a lot of room for Williams to develop on, which uh, always isn't a bad thing, but you certainly want to be starting off with a stronger base than what Williams have here, but that is it for the technical analysis, oh no, they're Sauber, I've completely forgotten about Sauber, how dare, how dare I, and they're not even called Sauber, they're called Alfa Romeo, for crying out loud, yes, of course, we talked at length about the Alfa Romeo, um, during the car launches and the Alfa Romeo front wing, of course, is the most radical on the grid. They have some really nice detail in in that front wing, and of course, they're just trying to really create create as much outwash and as much downforce as possible. And it seems to be working for them um, at the moment. The barge board area, some nice little cuts and slots on the leading edge of the of the floor and in the barge board area there. You know, it's looking very, very complex in that area, especially compared to any other midfield team. And that is why they are performing so well at the moment. And as you can see, they're on the rear wing, as we were talking about with Toro Rosso and Williams, where the front wing curves upwards. There was no cuts and and slots in the rear wing, but on the the Alfa Romeo, there is indeed. And of course, down where the Claro or whatever, how, however you pronounce that sponsorship's name, there are some lovely, lovely long strikes from that rear wing, which is just creating as much downforce leading down towards the diffuser as possible. But now that is actually the end of the technical analysis. Of course, as I mentioned at the start, we will talk about the racing point as we as um, it arrives on Thursday, Friday at Melbourne. Um, we'll talk about that probably post post after that because I'm quite busy because, of course, I will be going to that race. 
But that is it. I assume that we are going to see a couple more bits and pieces pop up on cars in terms of uh, developments um, next week in preseason testing. But that certainly has been very interesting to get a lot more, a lot better look and not sort of look at the CFD renders where, you know, everyone's been uh, hiding stuff. So good to see the cars and pictures of the cars up close and personal so we can actually talk about them in a technical way yeah thank you by the way for doing that technical analysis it was very very good and uh yeah hopefully you guys got uh, a good idea of what the teams are doing the different ideas they have and what they're trying to do in different ways for example um the renault rear wing which does look a lot different to other teams rear wings so thank you for doing that it was very good but guys that is it for this podcast reviewing the first preseason test and also doing some technical analysis and looking at some stats from the first test and as ever thanks to nib for coming along and talking about the teams from the first test and also analyzing yep. the cars technically so yeah thank uh thank you mate for uh coming along yeah, thank you, mate. I just uh, just got my breath back there after I, seemingly I was talking for about an hour about the cars. But yes, a very enjoyable um, technical analysis analysis that I did there. I do enjoy doing that. And once again, thank you for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Now, just to let you guys know, there will be another episode of the podcast coming out on Monday where we are going to be previewing the second test for the teams now the podcast previewing the second test is not going to be anywhere near most likely as long as this podcast was uh, but that will be coming out on monday hopefully say uh late afternoon early evening so make sure you are around for that but guys thank you for coming along and watching today's podcast don't forget to subscribe for more content like this I will be covering preseason testing from the track. I will be covering the second test. I cannot wait to see these cars and see who does have the pace and who does not. And really just to, to see Formula 1 cars again. I haven't gone to see Formula 1 cars since 2014 at the same track. So I cannot wait to go. And yet yeah, I am really looking forward to it. But don't forget to subscribe for more preseason content on the channel. Bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there, or click on my channel name, go to my channel page and subscribe, and hit the notifications bell for more content like this. Like this video, comment down below what you thought of this video, and comment down below what is your current pecking order, what did you think of the teams in the first test, and in that uh, technical uh, analysis that we did, was there anything that Nib missed uh, that you spotted? Make sure to put it in the comment section down below. As well, don't forget to join our Discord server. That is the best place to get notifications for my videos. And it's a great community over there. And also, when it comes to video clips from the second test, um, there's a lot better of a chance of video clips being on Discord or more so on Discord than actually in the video so don't forget to go and join that the link is in the description and also don't forget to follow me on twitter at chaz6110 and check out my website chazahd.com for more content like this but guys until monday where we're going to be previewing the second test for all the teams it's been me chazahd goodbye